again, everyone. It's good to have you with us for this event. Athletes, huddle up. It's time to begin. Get focused. Let's go. Athletes, take your mark. Get set. It's time for the Addict to Athlete podcast. Everybody out there, Coach Blue Robinson here. Hey, I want to thank you all so much for downloading, sharing, and subscribing to the podcast. Dang, we greatly appreciate you guys doing that. As always, I want to thank everybody who came out and participated in our 2023 Proxy Run 5K. That was a beautiful experience. We were able to celebrate those who have lost their battle to mental health and addiction by running proxy for them in the beautiful city of Spanish Fork, Utah. And we had a great turnout. And so I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out and sharing your loved one's story with us, being able to uh, to heal with every footstep. And really from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank everybody for coming out because it is a, a truly unique experience to come out here and celebrate the lives of those who have lost their battle. But to do so in the concept of healing and and uh, understanding that you know motion equals healing. So thanks so much for that. Uh, as we gear up now towards the fall experiences, we've got some awesome stuff on the horizon. Please check out our website, addicttoathlete.org. You'll find all kinds of content, you know, for information about the program, about how to you know, become involved in Team Addict to Athlete, but also all of our backlog podcasts, our team store, everything you need right there at addicttoathlete.org. Well, athletes, I'm excited today. In fact, I haven't, uh, as I'm thinking about this, I don't think I've really had a, 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 a strong cyclist uh, as a guest on the podcast. And so as I was talking to today's guest before we hit record, uh, Team Addict to Athlete kind of started with me doing a ton of mountain biking and cycling. And then when we started Addict to Athlete, because of the cost and the, the intensity sometimes that uh, revolves around getting things necessary to be a, become a cyclist, I had to uh, cross into the dark side and become a runner for a few years. But now, finally, we're starting to get some more people uh, to pedal their way to, to recovery. But I want to I wanna welcome Owen to the, to the podcast today. Owen, uh, thank you for being here. You're, you're part of the team uh, OptiCure, which is uh, based down of Salt Lake City up here. And uh, you have done some incredible things in the saddle on that bike. Um, would you mind uh, introducing yourself to Team Addict to Athlete? And uh, let's kind of jump into it from there. Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, my name's Owen Vermeulen. Um, yeah, I ride for uh, Team Opicure, uh, and yeah, I've just been really, really lucky to be able to link up with those boys at Assault Lake. I currently reside in Canada, in Vancouver, so, Beautiful. you know, to, we got some guys from, you know, Salt Lake, and then another one from Oregon, and, you know, me up here in Canada, so yeah, I've been really lucky to be able to link up with those guys, and just kind of, you know, get a little more open, and, you know try to share my story a little bit more than just, you know, on the road team, it was kind of keeping that, my history kind of silent and just being another bike racer. But so now, you know, being part of Opicure, it's uh, really has, you know, opened a lot of things for me and I hope for everyone else, try to inspire, you know, some people that are in recovery to get onto bikes. And I think it's a great project that they have and I'm very grateful to be a part of it. So beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, it's it's a it's a marriage made in heaven, I think. And when I first heard about Opicure and kind of what they were, were standing for, I was blown away uh, simply because not a lot of folks in that in that industry, I would say like the professional industry where they're using their their legs to kind of promote this this, this epidemic that has taken tons of lives. Um, and kind of put it out there. I mean, that's one of the most beautiful things I think about what this movement is all about, which is no longer staying silent in the anonymity of it all, but kind mm -hmm. of going out there and saying, hey, all of us are affected by this in some way, shape, or form. So I think it's cool that you're able to do that. But but Owen, would you mind yeah. just jumping in a little bit about your background, just kind of like you know, how your journey to, to finding yourself in the saddle kind of began? And uh, let's kind of take it from there, if, you, if you're okay with sharing some of your, your experiences and what brought you to, to, you know, to, to jump on the bike. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I, uh, back in the day I was a skateboarder and, you know, like I grew up with professional athletes in my family. I, my sister was an Olympic runner. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my dad was a pro hockey player at one point. So, you know, professional athletics was always big and, you know, athletics in general was always a big, big thing in our family. And I just ended up gravitating to skateboarding and, you know, back then it wasn't, you know, we weren't considered athletes. We were just skateboarders. So, you know, then just was doing that for years, kind of, uh, you know, some things happened in life where I ended up kind of on my own. 
um, across the country from family and whatnot at like 15 years old mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, try to fend for myself and just, uh, you know, get my life together and yeah just kind of ended up making some bad choices but then focused on skateboarding got pretty good um got some sponsors and all of that stuff and then you know injuries and back then you know skateboarding was big party scene so you know partying and injuries and partying and injuries just kind of let put me back down that road of uh you know just street drugs and to, and then at one point it just got so bad where I just ended up on the street, just using every day. And, you mm. know, it was like that for years. And then eventually I, uh, you know, after many attempts to, I was in and out of treatment centers, recovery houses, detoxes, you know, that whole in and out, in and out. And, uh, eventually got into a recovery house with a guy who owned a bike shop nice. and he ended up just, uh, was able to kind of get me a bike, like a pretty decent bike. And yeah, so we just, you know, we'd ride all day and then watch the Tour de France and ride some more. And then he kind (laughs) of, yeah, so he kind of got me a little bit more into like biking as and cycling as an endurance sport, not just, you know, because I used to just use it as commuting and having fun and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. But uh, he really kind of opened up my my life to that whole oh yeah these are this is how you train like you know so then I just yeah started riding all day every day and you know coming from skateboarding to get better you just do it all day every day and so that's kind of how I treated it so didn't really do any rest days didn't really do any recovery rides just rode all day every day and then Mm. just ended up racing on the road for quite a few years and you know had some results kind of moved up the categories on the road and then uh yeah i think it was like uh 2018 around then i started gravel riding and that's Uh when everything kind of changed was uh once i got onto the gravel bike that's when i really kind of found a super love for it was even better like you know the bike racing on the road was great but then you know once you get out into the wilderness and out in the middle of nowhere and you know just kind of that uh it was really my meditation and you know kind of my you know like the best thing about cycling is the community but also in on the completely other end of the spectrum you also get that alone time of Mm -hmm. just going out for a ride and kind of processing your thoughts and you know, kind of processing what's going on in your life. And so kind of merging those two aspects of the community and also being able to kind of have my alone meditation time on the bike, just, it worked perfectly for me. Um, So yeah, then just really took gravel racing kind of a little more serious and started doing some events. And, you know, I had little bit of power and fitness from road racing so uh and then the endurance just kind of came pretty naturally and i think i had uh, some genetics that probably helped for sure so, yeah that yeah. Uh, and then yeah it kind of got me to where i am now you know you say some awesome stuff and i want to kind of maybe pick your brain a little bit because i've noticed that when uh again when we first started added to athlete i had a lot of runners because it was it's the easiest thing to do and mm. eventually they'd all obviously we'd all start on the road but we'd all gravitate towards trail running and yep. you know these these like ultra marathons and these these really heavy duty things where you're just back out there in, in god's country and it's funny that you say that because I've never really thought about it that way either. But like, yeah, even like road cycling and then gravitating towards gravel. What do you think that pull is for people specifically in recovery that gets them into those kind of situations where they're like they're in nature? They're not just in the concrete jungle anymore because mm-hmm. I have my own theories about that. But like you, you're speaking some awesome truth here, man. Like, what do you what did you find the difference was? Because I think there might be something to this. Everyone kind of gravitates back to that that wilderness kind of that that you know this the strange locations and and you know the 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 tougher hills like what do you think yeah. causes that i think for me personally i can't speak for you know anybody else but for me specifically i think like i was in the downtown kind of you know like the 
downtown core of the really nasty neighborhood just Mm -hmm. on the streets using every day and I grew up in cities you know like back in Ontario and then you know before I came out here I was in New York City and I never Mm -hmm. skateboarding skateboarding you need the city like I was a street skateboarder so you know I was always in the city you know skating downtown skating different spots in the city and I think what it was was like I always loved like when I first came out here in 1994, I went and lived in the bush with my older brother in Tofino, <laughs> which is like a little kind of town. And we attempted to try to become surfers. And, you know, yeah. my brother was pretty good at it. I sucked at it. I really <laughs> underestimated it. But I think like I we kind of just had these little tents in the bush. And, you know, that was it was insane to me at the time it was I just felt so far removed from everything because I had just come from New York City Mm -hmm. and so I hitchhiked around and kind of went and did that and experienced those little towns but I was always in the city and I think that with the gravel bike it was you know road racing is great and I love the commodity and everything and you know there's a lot of tactics involved there's Mm -hmm. not necessarily the strongest guy doesn't always win um and I think for gravel cycling and you know it's it's like I have never, I would have never, ever seen or experienced some of these places had it not been for the gravel bike. Like uh, some of these beautiful places I've been and people I've met and, you know, where they've taken me on these really epic rides that the scenery is literally just like oil painting and just kind of blown away. And Mm -hmm. I think the more you see that, the more you want it. And you're like, oh, wow, well, this can really, really provide me like this experience to see some of nature and some of these places I would never, ever have been had I not, you know, taken this back road or this off this trail this way. And, you know, just kind of just letting it letting it take you where you need to go to try to get deeper into the forest or deeper into that wilderness. And as far as the racing aspect, I think that there's a level of suffering that all addicts can endure, you know, and it's a big, huge mental suffering, right? Like obviously for me, I was a heroin and cocaine addict, you know, and I was an IV user. So there was a lot of physical suffering as well, but I think the mental suffering is for gravel racing and, you know, it's, it's so hard. And I think that, you know, when you're out there in the wilderness and you're kind of in the middle of nowhere and, or you're on a gravel race that's so long and it's hot and it's hard, I think there's that mental game that really, really, uh, comes in handy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like some of the guys might, uh, I think the mental aspect comes in a lot more with gravel and off-road than, yeah than it does on the road. And I think that's kind of where I have gravitated to it is, you know, I love the suffering and I love the fact that, you know, I think it's a little bit of my mental state that keeps me going more so than my legs do. Mm -hmm. And I can attribute that to a lot of like what I've been through in my life. And also, you know, my history with addiction is kind of like, no matter how bad the suffering is, it still is nothing in compared to the suffering that addicts go through every day and Mm -hmm. so when it gets hard or when i feel like quitting it's just like dude this is so much better than any suffering that i've ever had so it kind of gives me that extra push i would say i love it i love it you're you're speaking the truth i remember asking one of my athletes who was a, a very strong trail runner i'm like how in the crud do you run up those hills like you do it like almost effortly. I'm like me, I'm power hiking. I'm stopping to maybe dry heave. I'm like, how are you doing that? He's like, well, it hurts. Uh He says, but it doesn't hurt as bad as it did when, you know, the department of family services came in and took my kids and I got arrested and the sound of the jail door slamming behind me. He's like, that hurt. So he says, when I'm running up these mountains, it hurts, but doesn't hurt as bad as that. I think that's one thing people in recovery kind of understand is that, they've already climbed you know figuratively the the most challenging mountains in life so they have experience so to speak and, and i love what you what you've what you've discussed here which kind of brings me to another question for you it's like 
you, you get into a situation in addiction where you're kind of captive, right? And it just, it just kind of takes you up yeah. and you're kind of locked. And then you get the sobriety under your bed a little bit. You get some recovery going. And all of a sudden, like freedom starts to kind of, you know, influence your life. And, and there's a difference, I think, with the freedom of, of being out there on the trail, like miles away, you know, versus, the, again, the concrete jungle there in the city. Um, how do you liken that to your own experience? I mean, you know, out there as far as, as you thought was you know, humanly possible and looking around and being like, this is freedom. Because mm-hmm. I always think it's a funny thing, man. A lot of people in recovery, they're they're afraid of freedom, right? They 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 literally are are, are scared of like what freedom can bring because there's a lot of responsibilities and there's a lot of unknowns. Um, did you find that kind of at first when you started kind of getting your head clear a little bit? Like, I can go farther, I can do more. I don't have to just be captive here in this state, in, in this experience. I don't have to just be an addict. Now I'm a cyclist. Now I'm, you know, a, a gravel cyclist. Does, does that make sense? Like, did you feel the measure yeah. of the freedom that you're were, you were creating in your life? Yeah, I think so. It's like in, in addiction, it's like, I think you're living such a day-to-day life, right? Like it's just, for me, it was day-to-day. The only thing that would ever change is if I went to jail. That was like mm-hmm. kind of the only thing is either I would die or I would go to jail. And that was kind of the two major things that would change that day to day. And, you know, obviously, thankfully, I didn't die. I did end up in prison for a little while, um, you know, and I think that's just mm-hmm. petty crimes that addicts have to do just to mm-hmm. survive. And, um, yeah, I think that when you kind of have that uh survival instinct of okay i just need to get through the next day um it sets your mind to just yeah like i said that survival instinct where now when you get some time under your belt and you get some freedom you're looking more forward to what you can do what the possibilities are and i think that living in addiction for so long you don't think of possibilities you don't think of oh, what can I do or what's available to me or what, you know, what hopes and dreams do I have? Because none of that is in the forefront of your mind. It's just survive, get through today, worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And I think that that sense of freedom is a little bit daunting. It was for me too. It was like, okay, now I have options. Now I have this freedom to be able to, and like my mind just needed to kind of shift into, okay, well, what's realistic for my hopes and dreams yeah what's what's attainable and how do i go about you know reaching these goals and reaching these dreams and i think that it's such a mental shift from the day to day of addiction and i think that's what's a little was a little bit daunting for me was knowing okay well now there's pressure and responsibility i have to put on myself to be able to follow through with these goals and these dreams and hopes and um, I think that that's maybe where the freedom um, of sobriety is a little bit daunting for some who are first in recovery is because they have to get out of that survival instinct and move mm-hmm. into, you know, now I have a life and now what can I do with it? And that's a big, it's, yeah. you know, it's like being born, you know, mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a daunting, it's a, it's pretty daunting when you have all yeah. of that options. And yeah. so I think just getting out of that survival instinct is, is hard. You know, I, I love it. And, and I love being able to talk to you because again, I haven't really had anyone that, that understands like some of these deeper principles of cycle on the uh, cycling on the podcast. And, you know, years ago when I first had the idea for Addict to Athlete, I was biking up, you know, the, the, the mountains here with, with a client I was you know, working with. Kid was, I think like 15 years old and we were going up to Sundance, Utah here in the, in the, you know, the Provo Canyon area in Utah. And, uh, I'm cruising up next to him when we're talking and, you know, he's a client of mine. I'm his therapist and we're out biking and I look over at him and he's like freaking Jan Ulrich in, in like the toughest gear, just powering up this hill. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, dude, you need to shift, man. And he's like, yeah. what do you mean? I'm like, you need to freaking shift down, get into your lower gear. And he shifts down. All of a sudden he's like, you know, Oh, Hey, yeah. And I'm like, dude, how is that like your life? We just got done with a phone call with your parents. You were like pushing your way through. You were just exerting too much energy to try to get your point across. When all you needed to do literally was just shift down in your in your, in your your attitude, your mindset. And look how that could have been different. And it was such this visual for me. That's kind of what kicked off this thought for like, wait a minute. The metaphors of sport, athletics, recreation, 
they go hand in hand with recovery. Um, Literally and figuratively, I know you've had to do that in your own life, like shift down, like, wait a minute, man, I'm trying way too hard. What was that aha moment for you in your in your recovery where you're like, wait a second, I had to shift down here and not exude so much energy. Um, do you remember kind of that aha moment where you, you figuratively like shifted down and like, wait a minute, I'm I'm doing this, you know, I'm putting too much energy or too much, you know, passion into this when really I should be doing that. Like, what was that pivot point for you? Um, I think for me, it was just kind of, um, well, I met my now wife and partner. So ah, she was, yes. she's a huge, huge supporter and has been awesome. with me through all of everything. And, you know, I can't exclude her in any of this. She's been, you know, massive, massive support for me and everything I've been through. But I think like, you know, in the past, I would get out of treatment and I would want everything as Mm -hmm. soon as possible and that's the addict mentality right you want everything now and you know sometimes you get out of treatment you have nothing no furniture no nothing you know like you basically have a backpack and that's your belongings so you know i've rebuilt my life i don't know how many times and i've gotten to be pretty Mm -hmm. good at it um but i think that i wanted everything so fast i got a great job you know i got a great apartment got all of this got all of that And it was just such a force to get all of that as soon as possible, where the stress and anxiety of all of that stuff, it would just rebuild and I'd end up relapsing again. And, you know, like you said, I just charge it so forward into like, okay, now I need to just be a responsible adult and live life and get all of these things. Mm -hmm. And it never lasted. And I think, um, you know, kind of what was that pivotal point for me was with cycling was a good, was a good, um, was a good part of my recovery because I knew it was something that I needed to be patient with. And that took time. If I wanted to be good at it, if I wanted to be any good at it, or if I wanted to achieve the things that I wanted to achieve on the bike, I needed to gear down and just take the time and go through the training or go through what I needed to go through. And it's nothing you can rush. And I think that's with any athletics is, mm-hmm. you know, you want to get good at it. You can't get good in a day. You know, it's like that whole 10,000 hours makes an expert type of thing is that yeah. you can't be an expert right away. And so I think everything that I wanted um, in the past, I wanted too quickly and I needed to get it super fast and it would just end up blowing up in my face where I think it was, I don't know exactly when, but yeah, I kind of looked at my life and I was like, okay, you know, like my relationship is great. You know, my passions for cycling is great. You know, like I'm working in a job that I am part of, like it feels like a career move. I'm not just another worker, another job. So, and these things in work and cycling and relationship, everything that I realized that was going to be good in my life needed to take time to work on. And Mm. I needed to just step back and realize, okay, if these things are going to be good in my life, I need to just, I can't rush into it. And I need to just take the time and go through the steps and yeah, let it come to yeah. me as opposed to trying to go and get it. I love it. I, I love that mindset, you know, and it reminds me kind of like the situation that, that we find ourselves in with the people around us, right? I mean, I'm sure you've been in situations, even in road cycling, where there's a bunch of teams around you, you're all working towards the same goal. And if you find yourself kind of in you know, a little bit of the middle of the pack or the peloton, right, the big group of cyclists, you can kind of use a little less effort But you've got to be 100% aware. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. for those of you that have never really been on a bike in a situation like this, you're you are literally like centimeters away from the tire in front of you, and your your eyes are kind of focused right there in that little teeny gap in between your front wheel and the back wheel of someone in front of you. Um, And you've got to be paying attention to multiple things, right? You got to be paying attention to the speed, the flow, the traffic ahead, you know, the the obstacles, um, all within centimeters of each other you know, there's this organized kind of confusion of, of being kind of in the middle of that pack. Tell me your thoughts on something like that in recovery, where it's like, you got a lot to lose if you, you know, get distracted, but at the same time, you're using other, you know, teammates and, and, you know, other teams to get to that goal. It's kind of like the social network that we have around ourselves. Like you have to change 
everything about your circle of friends, right? I mean, yep. that's what I love about it. I mean, even though there's different teams next to you, your goal is the same. Um, and I don't think we utilize a lot of those things in in recovery, right? When we got our counselors and therapists, we have our mentors and our family, and we're all kind of moving down that 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 section. And every once in a while, you get a jerk that pops in there and tries to like mess things up for you. But mm-hmm. have you ever likened kind of like you know being there in the middle of the peloton to recovery with like everyone around you, at the same time making sure that you're keeping yourself okay, that you're watching that tire in front of you, that you're seeing the movement and the the grace of the of the little machine that's moving forward. Who's your support system? You know, like have you ever noticed the the the, the, the I don't know the connection between the two? Actually, yeah. Now that you mention it like that, it is kind of a very, a very good analogy to recovery really, because yeah, when you're in a group of riders, like, yeah. when you're in, in the Peloton, it's all about your spatial awareness, right? You need -hmm. need spatial awareness and you need to stay, you know, switched on, um, not just for your own safety, but for the safety of uh, all the riders around you. And nobody wants to be that guy that crashes everybody out. Right. And, um, so, you know, I think it's a matter of trusting that the group you're in is, you know, everybody's at a good level, everybody's at a high level, a certain level where they all are just as switched on as you and, mm-hmm. you know, just as aware as you and, you know, their skills are just as good as you or yours are as good as theirs. And, um, yeah, and then it just works as like a washing machine effect, you know, it just kind mm-hmm. of circles around and everybody does their job. Um, but yeah, in recovery, I think it's very similar is that one false move and everything goes down. And yeah, it's, it's not just, um, you know, like for me, when I'm in a group like that, it's like, I think of everybody else around me. If I, if I make a dumb move or if I make a stupid move, I, it's, I'm not just hurting myself, I'm hurting everybody else around me. And yep. I think in recovery, it's the same way is where, Absolutely. you know, if I don't stay focused on my recovery or if I put myself in risky situations, then I am not only just jeopardizing my own recovery, but it's, I have to also look at what I put all of my family and friends through and mm-hmm. they will have to go through all of that again with me. So it's very similar, I guess, to that Peloton analogy is that one yeah one false move or you know a risky situation where yeah you kind of have to just trust in your surroundings trust in the people around you and know we're all in here for the same reasons and we're all Mm -hmm. in here to kind of get to the same goal and you know yeah one false move and you know i'm putting my my wife through all of that again and yeah or i'm putting my family through all of that again and you know, so just avoiding yeah. those risky situations. And it is a good analogy, actually, is, yeah, one false move and everybody else goes down. It's not just you. Yeah, I think about, it. you know, I've, I've, I'm a therapist and I've led many groups where that we've had this really strong cohesion. But then someone kind of goes a little bit rogue, maybe comes in with a relapse or tries to bring another group member, you know, down with them. And it's the mm-hmm. same concept, right? It's like, you know, yeah. you don't realize the magnitude of your influence until you start creating, you know, some conflict or some waves. And so yeah. I've always thought about that when I've seen that, especially when you watch like a big accident, like in, like in the Tour de France or something, you, you see everyone go down. And there's some on the outside and some in the middle that kind of can skate through. But that's a bad concept of, of like, yeah, spatial awareness, um, you know, your, your, your connection to the person next to you. And I think it's awesome that you have enough emotional empathy to think about the other people around you because, you know, again, no one wants a broken collarbone, as our producer Max will tell you, because he broke his, you know, doing some goofy things on an electric bike. So <laughs> it's, the, it's the concept of like making sure that you're safe and everyone else is safe, even if you're competitors, you know, it's the same principles. And I love that, man. But, you know, shifting gears, literally, brother, um, I'm curious, you know, you've done some amazing races and some cool events. Like, what are some of those events that you've done that truly stand out to you as as you're kind of like, man, I'm here now. Like I was I was there struggling, but now I'm here. Have you ever had like an event or or, or, experience where you've been on the bike somewhere? You're like looking around, you're like, see the magnitude of how far you've come. You're like, wow, this is this is powerful. I can't, you know, this is amazing that I've been able to, you know, create a path uh, to, to come here. Anything that stands out to you in an event or, or a race that you've been in? Yeah, there's, um, 
Definitely, definitely. There's probably two. Um, the first one I think is just uh, a couple years ago in Unbound. It's a 200 mile gravel race in Kansas, and um, you know, like nobody comes out of that race unscathed. Like obviously, yeah. I had some problems, but I think you know, I reached, I had a goal in mind, and I did a lot better than that goal and um you know i'm sitting at the finish line and you know there's photographers taking pictures of me and they're asking me who my name who i am and what's my name and all this stuff and i'm just sitting on the concrete and i'm just covered in mud and you know just been racing for 10 and a half hours and it's it was just kind of hit me where i was like whoa like this is this is intense like this is for real Mm. like and athletically i think i did a great job on the bike like just physically nice i think i i reached you know some power numbers that i was very very proud of like you know as far as my fitness like i think i finished that race like you know the best of my ability at the time and yeah it was that one but i think the one that stands out the most was just earlier this year there was a eight day gravel stage race in columbia Mm. where we went from um we went from Cali to Bogota across the Andes all Dang. on back. Yeah. So it was all on back gravel roads and it's called trans And so there's three mountain ranges within the Andes in Northern Colombia. And so we crossed those mountain ranges and yeah, I think it was, well, I work in kilometers and meters, but it was about 23, thousand meters of elevation over the eight days and about a thousand kilometers yeah so you know like we went through the largest wax palm forest in the world um went through the coffee region and you know we went up to four that over four thousand meters above sea level to this area called uh the paramo do sumapas and yeah you just kind of stop there (laughs) for a minute and just be like wow like you know there's actually going to be a little mini documentary about that trip um that uh that is that will be coming out soon so it's just basically a little bit of a story about how i came from my life in addiction you know kind of the the lows lows of you know Mm -hmm. addiction on the streets to kind of the high highs of you know the gravel racing in colombia in some of these incredible places and you know i was really really grateful to have uh the trans Cordageras organizers give me some good footage so there's just some amazing drone footage nice. and yeah you're riding through these areas and you're just like what the fuck like excuse my language but you're like how you're did fine. i get here like how did i get this here this is insane like you know however many years ago like you know 15 years ago i did, wouldn't even thought that i would be allowed out of the country let alone mm-hmm. like racing in such incredible beautiful area and you know, like the wax palm forest stage, I think that was stage five. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was incredible. The views were just, you know, like I, and I don't tend to stop in races, but I kind of slowed down. I pulled out my phone, took some video and, you know, cause everybody's blown apart at this point anyway, everybody's on. That's another part, you know, sorry to sidetrack. I do. No, you're fine. Go ahead. I do that quite often, but yeah, that's the one thing I do love about these gravel events. Sometimes is everybody, starts together and like you know you kind of get into your own little rhythm and you know sometimes there might be a pack of a few riders but everybody blows apart into their own little now they're racing themselves you know Mm -hmm. and and you don't you might see a rider ahead or behind and kind of you know chase or you know follow or you know try to ride ahead but it's yeah, so it was kind of nice to try to get those solo moments within the race where I kind of pull out my phone and just take, snap a few photos and be like, this is insane. Like, this is where I am right now in, you know, 4,000 meters above sea level and like what looks like a moonscape and the most beautiful yeah. area I've ever been in my life. And yeah, and like that race was amazing. Like, I can't even See. express it enough. Like, it was yeah just to be there and to get there and be like wow like you know 15 years ago i would have never ever thought that i would have been anywhere close to where i was or less than 15 years like it's you know it was incredible you know i i think about that kind of stuff too to to go places that that not a lot of people get 
the privilege to see and you know doing some mountain biking and some you know some trail running and stuff i've been in places like that where you look at the plant life you're like dude this looks like another planet like it's crazy mm-hmm. but you know down on the ground level sea level there you'd never know that stuff even existed so i can yeah. totally hear that that passion in there and being able to you know, to take a moment, you know, and to just be for, for even a second, you know, and to capture something like that. I mean, yeah. it's a race and it's an important, but also it's like, it's something bigger than that. And I think sometimes we lose sight of that because yeah, there are a lot of people sure. that blew through that and didn't even notice, but like being oh, yeah. able to say, wait a second, this is for me. That's kind of a cool thing because, you know, in addiction, we're always suppressing that stuff. We're never taking that time to like, you know, take a look at, you know, the, the what is. And I remember talking to a kid years ago who uh, went skiing for the very first time, not high. And when he came back and he was telling me, he's like, I had had no idea that you could smell the pine trees up there and the way that the sun mm-hmm. kind of hit off the, off, the, off the snow and the powder. And he's like, I never really noticed that. And I thought that being high and doing that uh what was was the best thrill ever but he's like i didn't realize how much was out there and how much i missed and i've always thought that that like it you know using it that doesn't enhance your experience you might think it does but you miss so much and so i oh, love yeah. that story man does, does that make sense oh yeah for sure and i think like as addicts i can only speak for myself mm-hmm. but i think in general is we are like myself i think just inherently you know society just puts so much stigma around mental health and addiction. Mm -hmm. So there's an inherent shame that is just built in with, within an addict, right? Like, so, and I think that when I was using and then I started, I would get some months clean and then I would relapse and the shame would just get more and more intense. Right. So I always was just so in my head about like, oh, I'm the worst person. I'm doing such shitty stuff. And, you know, look at me. I'm just a useless addict. And so you're not really like giving yourself the benefit of the doubt, I think, takes time in recovery. Right. So even when I was clean and I wasn't sharing my story or my history when I was just bike racing on the road, I didn't want to tell anybody about it. I just wanted to be another bike racer. And that was just because of the shame involved. Right. And then I started to think, and you know, my wife would say, this is like, you know, you've come so far. Like, and I think that there's a lot of addicts that because of that shame, they don't give themselves enough credit for how Mm -hmm. far they've come. And, you know, so when you get to these places, like for myself in Colombia, it's like, I kind of had it to just give myself the permission to be like, this is amazing. I've done something really incredible for myself Mm -hmm. Um, because giving myself permission to, to be happy and to, 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 you know, give myself the permission to, yeah, like I said, just be happy and be amazed with myself never happens. Like yeah. at least for an addict, like you never give yourself the permission to be happy or to give yourself credit for something or to be proud of yourself. Because yes. for myself, like I was never proud of myself. I never gave, I was never happy. I, you know, I never gave myself credit for anything because I was always so shameful of my life. And I mm-hmm. think that giving myself that permission to be like, okay, this is amazing. What I've done is yeah. really, really incredible. And you know, I, I think that addicts need to do that a little bit more. And I think that that's with sharing my story. That's kind of what I hope to have to bring to other addicts as well, is that give yourself that permission to be like, damn, what I've just achieved is incredible. I've not yeah. only got out alive, but now I'm doing something and being somewhere and with people that are incredible. And, mm. you know, to try to give yourself that permission to be like, yeah, I've achieved something really, really incredible. <laughs> I love it, man. And and listeners, I hope you take what Owen said right there to heart because you don't give yourselves enough credit. And sometimes, you know, know, when you're climbing up a hill and there's no spectators and it was freaking epic, you've got to be able to be your own cheerleader now now and then and be like, dude, I just crushed that. Like, and no one would ever know but you. But being able to do that, I think, is a huge, I don't know, a boost of of emotional currency, so to speak. Like you're, you're cashing in on your efforts. And sometimes when you have those victories and no one's around, those kind of are kind of the most beautiful. 
and no one would believe you if you tried to tell them, right? But because they weren't there. But yeah, I, I love that principle, brother. And, I, and thank you for sharing that aspect. And and what you said makes a lot of sense too. And I, and I teach my athletes the same thing. I'm like, in life, in recovery, and everything we do, we're always kind of trying to drive towards that horizon, right? We want to get to the horizon. But the bugger is, once we get to the horizon, it changes. It's further away. Like we yeah. never kind of get there. But like what you just said, to be able to emotionally, figuratively, and maybe even, you know, like, 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 you know, stop for a minute and turn around and see how far you've come. Like, that's kind of what I hear you saying. Like, yeah. look at how far I've come and to give myself enough credit for, to do that. And you can always see those monuments and those, those roadblocks and everything that you'd already passed. You can see those, but you're never going to hit the finish line. I mean, it's the horizon keeps changing. It's one of the coolest yeah. metaphors. So we're kind of always in the middle. We're kind of in the gap, which is yeah. awesome because that means we're not done yet. Right. Yeah. And I think that's, um, like I think with what you're doing and, you know, like with what Opicure is doing is sharing those stories. Yeah. And I think the more we get people's stories, like, you know, your athlete stories and stories like, you know, with what Opicure is doing and stories from anyone that have maybe had those struggles in mental health or those struggles in addiction and then sharing those stories of overcoming and, you know, it's like anything, it breeds and, you know, it, it breeds more success and it breeds more celebration for people to come out and say, Hey, look, like I'm proud of myself. Look at what I've just overcome. And mm -hmm. I think that's kind of, you know, like the whole reason why I wanted to do this documentary about the uh, trip from, you know, being on the streets using to, you know, racing across the Andes in the middle of the jungle was, kind of that inspiration to be like look like and if i can do it anyone can and i think yeah. that the more i think athletes that have had struggles can share those the more people will come forward and mm -hmm. i think it just will snowball and that's what i hope for is to kind of create that snowball effect where you know maybe each and other stories just create yeah. more stories and better inspiration and more because I would love to see that just snowball effect is, of helping one another. And yeah, yeah, and that's that's the beauty of it. That's why when I started at it to athlete, it want it was you know the first principle was to change the public's perception on what oh, yeah. an addict is. And and in fact, I don't even let my my guys call themselves addicts anymore. I'm like, hey, you know that you have it, but it's a part of you. It's not who you are. Now you're champions, and now you're now you're cyclists, now you're runners, now you're athletes, and so moving from addict to an athlete you don't have to stay there anymore and so here mm -hmm. we're wearing our jerseys and stuff and and you know it says addict to athlete on there and people will say hey what's that and all of a sudden they become an ambassador to their recovery they're talking to somebody about their recovery and that person always says hey i'm in recovery too or i have a family member that struggles it's so cool to see that you guys can can do this you know can i can i you know send them to you guys like it's one of the neatest things because the anonymity i think in 2023 of it all it's kind of a deadly thing. And I get the principles behind the 12 steps. And I think they're fantastic. But I also think there's there's more than one path, right? I mean, there's more than one mm -hmm. way to do this. And that's why I love what, what Opicure is doing and, and kind of what, oh, you're, yeah. what, you're just, what you're talking about is no longer in the shadows. Let's talk about this because everyone's affected by this. I'm sure you've had that conversation before, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's, I think, what uh, really kind of bolstered my efforts to come out with it was what seeing what Opicure was doing right and mm -hmm. to seeing like wow like okay yeah you know like you look at Alcoholics Anonymous it's been around since like what 1932 yeah. and they're using the same principles and whatever works for anyone I support if that's what works for you and that's what's going to get you clean and sober all the power mm -hmm. to you but for me, I tried so many different paths and this was the one that really stuck. And yes, I think that, um, like you said, in 2023, I think there's a lot of other means of recovery and it's not necessarily just recovery, but it's the sustainability of it. What's going to keep me motivated? What's going to keep me in, in this lifestyle that's a healthy lifestyle that's not just sitting outside a a church chain smoking and drinking coffee and drinking coffee, you mm -hmm. know, like that's great if that's going to keep you sober, but it's also what's sustainable about it is like for myself. And I think for what you're doing and what Opicure is doing is that 
it's creating something that's sustainable throughout time is that's going to keep people motivated and keep people pushing and Absolutely. yeah not having that anonymity about it is showing that, that is possible and giving people say oh well wow well, maybe that bike is what i need to get clean maybe that mm-hmm. bike is what's going to keep me clean not just yeah. get me clean but keep me clean and that's what love it for myself what was the difference was there's a lot of things that got me clean but for myself it was the bike that kept me clean and that was the big one i think I, I love it. I love it, man. Did, I, time flies so fast, and I'm like, there's there's a million and one things. So I'm sure we'll have to have you back on again, brother. But I'm curious. <laughs> and when the camera on, works. Yeah, yeah, we got to see that. Got to see that 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 great mug of yours. Um, I'm curious, what do you got coming up uh, that you're looking forward to? And then maybe how do people, you know, how do they find you? Because I think that you're you're someone that the athletes are going to want to follow and support, just because again, you you've got that rhythm of recovery that that reminates with with some of these these athletes athletes what's on your horizon and then how can people follow you yeah um well everybody can follow me on instagram it's uh owen vermulen 78 um yeah sorry the camera wasn't working i don't know if i'm pretty technology stupid but uh but uh yeah we'll get on again and and do this again sometime but uh yeah you can follow me on instagram um and like i said that documentary uh yes. with my friend nate uh who's helping me with that we've got some other sponsors involved like with the feed and opicure is a big part of that as well um so you know we've got great partners uh throughout the team and throughout for this documentary as well so i think that will be a really really fun thing to uh show the world is Very it cool. was kind of daunting and a little bit scary but uh yeah i yeah. think it, i think if it can help people that's what i'm motivated about it for is so be it yeah. but yeah you can follow me on instagram and stuff and yeah i've got some events coming up i fly out to california and then to uh, kansas to bwr kansas and then look towards next year and kind of dial in some more events Love and it, man yeah just keep keep this gravel thing going i hope to get back to columbia and relive that again that was incredible so yeah so, got so cool a lot of events but there's so many cool events, so it's really hard to, we'll have to sit down and kind of see which ones that will suit me and which ones that I haven't experienced and want to experience. Absolutely, man. Yeah. And, and athletes, yeah, we'll, we'll put all, all of Owen's socials up there so you guys can follow him. But uh, thank you for jumping on here, man, and, and, and bearing with us as we were trying to figure out technology on our side, too. Appreciate that. But, you know, athletes, you've been absolutely well fed. You know, continue to do what you do to strive for that recovery, um, you know, to, to erase that addiction by replacing it with things of greater value, like what Owen's talking about. You know, jump on that bike, dust it off if it's sitting in your garage. And before we started recording, we had talked about, doesn't matter you know what you start with you can always you know move up as you become you know stronger in in your in your field and, and more solid on the ground um but nonetheless owen thanks so much for being a guest here today yeah appreciate you doing it brother thank and, you so uh, much athletes, man. yeah athletes do your best and remember to always turn your mess into a message